Hello, and welcome to MIT's Open Documentary Lab and Co-Creation Studio. I'm William Uricchio, Professor of Comparative Media Studies and uh, the founder and principal investigator of the Open Doc Lab. And today we'll have our first conversation about augmenting public space in order to reframe and reveal the stories of place, layers of place. Before turning to the panel, I'd like to share my screen and uh, frame the conversation uh, that we'll be having in this series by asking three questions. Why augmentation? Why documentary? Why now? Augmentation is enjoying its, its moment. Once the lesser discussed end of the XR spectrum and dominated by the marketing efforts of HoloLens and Magic Leap, augmentation's potentials are being realized, including the agenda mapped out 10 years ago in the AR Art Manifesto. Consumer-friendly software packages, relatively low-cost projection systems, ubiquitous headsets uh, and earbuds, and more have opened the way for widespread experimentation. Challenges remain, of course, discoverability, accessibility, and visual display technologies prominent among them. But perhaps the most unnecessary challenge is our inclination to reinvent the wheel rather than to learn from those who came before us. Augmentation of the spaces and places around us is one of our oldest and most persistent uses of media. It's there in the trail of breadcrumbs, there in the multi-sensory techniques we found to communicate information about space and place. In its analog and material forms, augmentation is invisible to some while opening worlds of insight and meanings to others. It is as old as our species and goes far beyond it. In fact, Carlo Ginzburg attributes the genesis of narrative to the making coherent of augmented signs, the reading of nature's traces, the indexicality mistakenly claimed by representation systems like film and photography, but here in its full glory and the tracks left by passing creatures. We've since found myriad ways of marking our places and our pasts. Digital systems have brought with them new techniques, but they haven't changed the main uses of augmentation, whether memorialization, and marking sites of common interest or marking sites of personal interest, a tradition denigrated by some as graffiti and celebrated by others, like Guy Debord of the Situationists as psychogeography. Anyway, the point is to learn from these traditions as we explore the possibilities of a newer generation of technology. Why documentary? After all, documentary may seem an odd entry point to discuss the augmentation of public spaces and places, at least if the word documentary conjures up Ken Burns in your mind. It's true that most documentaries are textual forms like films and videos that make arguments about something in the world and that help us to see in a more informed and critical manner. The Open Doc Lab and the Co-Creation Studio have spent the past decade exploring other ways of thinking about documentary considering it less of a thing and more of a mission. We've been examining conditions like interactivity and immersion, processes like collaboration and co-creation, and settings that enable discovery, sharing, reflection, and action. Rather than thinking about the documentary as a standalone text, a film, an interactive website, or eight minutes behind the VR, uh, headset, we want to look at documentary's possibilities as a relationship between signification, the informational tags, sound and visual overlays just discussed, and places in the world. As I've just alluded, this is a familiar practice that often takes the form of signs, the, the, the George Washington slept here variety, encouraging us to look at the ordinary in a more informed way. How might this work digital technologies and with documentary ends. What conversations might ensue from annotation of the world in the world rather than sectoring it off to the confines of the cinema and the living room? Because augmentation technologies in many cases are relatively accessible, might they enable greater numbers of people to share in the work of augmentation, multiplying the stories and enhancing the complexity of the meanings appended to the world? The fundamental conceits of documentary to help us see the world with new eyes, to reveal contested and included meetings, to confront us with alternatives to the status quo, all seem more directly achievable by scratching our marks on the surface of the world itself. And why now? 
After a year long global lockdown, is there any better reason to re-enter public space armed with new ideas and visions? I don't wanna sound ungrateful, but the end of life on Zoom is in sight. So what kind of public spaces will we re-enter? At least the public spaces that I see reflect particular configurations of power and history, celebrating some among us and including others. The patterns are systematic and the master narrative seems irrevocable, but it's not. These are the traces of cultural legacy. They reflect themselves in our moment in the sun, of course, but they are not immutable. And they become much more interesting and yes, complicated when more voices can be heard and more visions shared. That complexity, that polyvocality, as far as I'm concerned, is a wonderful affordance of augmentation. And it's the core business for the documentary. Together, augmentation and documentary offer a powerful set of instruments to challenge and complicate the order of things. Um, yeah. Two last things uh, before I introduce uh, Sarah Wallison. Space or place. <laughs> Deserto's in, uh, invention of everyday life um, or the tradition of placemakers, city planners and architects. If you track prose carefully, you'll see that I'm of the Deserto persuasion. But the conversation we're having, having needs to be inclusive, particularly of the people who spend their careers thinking about space, uh, spaces, I mean places. And finally, a big thanks to our sponsors, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, MIT's Transmedia Story Initiative, to our partners, Magnum, Centrafi, and the International Documentary Festival, Amsterdam's Doc Lab, and to our wonderful team, and in particular, our, our research assistant, Ambar Reyes Lopez, and our producer, Claudia Romano. I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Sarah Wallison, uh, director of Open Documentary Lab and the moderator of today's panel, Sarah. Thanks, William, and thanks for that wonderful presentation and grounding for our panel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's panel, Layers of Place, the Art of Augmenting Public Spaces and Places with Story Technologies. In an article for Ford Foundation's Creative Future series about place, Sonia Chiltris, in talking about the documentary industry rights, there is a perceived industry bias against supposedly smaller local stories, a bias exasperated by the increasing dominance of streaming platforms and cable outlets seeking nonfiction content with broad commercial appeal. And in a field that lacks guiding principles around ethical and accountable filmmaking, this race to gain access to captivating stories, no matter the location, can quickly lead to drive-by filmmaking. Not only do the filmmakers return to their home cities immediately after shooting out of financial necessity or desire, but they take with them their films, which are shared more frequently in other communities outside of the one where the story originated. What has become clear is that while industry norms may produce exciting content, ultimately they do not serve diverse artists, the communities, and the center of nonfiction stories, the communities at the center of nonfiction stories or the environment. Our panel today explores what happens when documentary stories are told in place using augmentation technologies, perhaps offering some alternatives to the problem Sonia outlines. While different than a documentary film, we challenge documentarians to think about other story forms and processes and keeping them in community. While many of these place-based stories can be seen beyond the places where the stories are situated, we will look at what it means to create and experience a story in the place it's about, to append it to a place, and look at how it transforms your sense of that place. We'll look at the affordances of working with augmentation technologies to bring out these stories. How can we use them to reveal the hidden and buried stories and transform our perception of the place to make it better known? or make it better known. So often when you enter a place, the stories of the people living there are invisible. Whether it's a building that once was a central meeting place or housing and now is a condo complex with no trace of what was, or an important event such as a riot or protest that is left forgotten, 
or a statue in a central plaza of a man celebrated as a war hero and great explorer, ignoring the acts of murder and the people who had lived there for generations. Unknown graveyards lie buried under buildings and lands that were stolen by settlers have deep histories and stories that only the indigenous elders of the community know. We're now at an interesting moment for in-place storytelling. It's a moment of national reckoning with our memorials, our public histories, and whose stories we tell in our public spaces and places. It's also a moment when it's getting easier to create augmented reality experiences, to append images and sounds to our physical environments, given the 5G network and better location-aware sensors on our phones. But we also risk watching this digital layer become another place for tech monopolies and surveillance. Most important is who is using and designing the technologies and to what ends. Today, we have four pioneering artists to speak with us who have been augmenting places with sounds, projections, mobile AR, theater, and many other techniques for a lot longer than this current moment. We'll learn about their processes, their experiences, the collaborations, and the potentials and challenges of working with augmentation technologies, communities, and stories in place. So here they are. I'll invite them on. Their camera's on. Hello, hello. We have Jackson Two Bears, um, Ghanaian Ganaga multimedia installation performance artist and cultural theorist from Six Nations, and Tindy Nega, sound artist and technologist Halsey Bergen, activist, performance artist, and social entrepreneur Len Kantav, and Tamiko Thiel, a digital media artist. It's also her birthday today, so happy birthday, Tamiko, and thank you for being here with us. Um, we've asked each of them to present their work and answer the question, why do you work with augmentation technologies and techniques in public spaces? They'll also share a brief case study of one of their projects. So we'll start with Jackson Two Bears. Hello, can you hear me okay? Good. Uh, just share my screen here real quick. Good. Uh, Sego, Skanagogan, uh, Ne Jackson Deoni Ogawes, Uniots, uh, Shwego Nituageno, uh, Geniagahaga, No Wakahun Sonta, Nawen, Winagoa, uh, Techinawarton, uh, Blackfoot, uh, Traditional Territory, Treaty 7, uh, Namagoa. Um, thank you for, uh, for inviting me today and allowing me to introduce myself in my language and to just give a brief, um, uh, acknowledgement to where I'm, I'm coming to you today from uh, uh, Treaty 7 Blackfoot Territory, otherwise known as Lethbridge, Alberta, in Canada. And it's important uh, for me and for us to uh, just take a moment to acknowledge that as, uh, you know, uh, quite appropriately, this is a conversation today about place. And uh, just to begin by saying that, you know, place for Haudenosaunee people, for Indigenous people is integral to our way of life, to our traditional teachings, to the way that we see ourselves in the world. And so from that, uh, that's uh, from that sort of traditional teaching base is where a lot of my work comes from. And I'm going to be sharing with you today a, a project that's sort of in progress uh, and briefly talking about that. Uh, the project I'm going to talk about today is uh, entitled Ne Guitsturagon. Gonusa Gonwe Isa Onkwe Honwe, which is essentially uh, a, a kind of uh, gift to the to place, a gift to uh, this territory, uh, and Onkwe Honwe is our Haudenosaunee word for our, for for us, for original people. Um, and uh, let me just begin by saying, uh, as a quick kind of overview, um, that my research, generally speaking. Uh, is very interested in indigenous land-based histories, uh, embodied cultural knowledge, uh, and really uh, over the last 10 or more years has been about exploring digital technologies uh, as a way or as a means to support the innovation, transmission, uh, expression, and transformation of, uh, of indigenous knowledge practices and creative cultural practices. Uh, particularly focused uh, uh, for myself as a Haudenosaunee person, uh, but also as a guest here, as I've been living here and working in Blackfoot territory, um, that my work is also, um, uh, for some projects, have been grounded here. Um, but the project I'm talking to you today is about uh, a large-scale site-specific work. 
And uh, what I'm showing you here is a photograph of the site that we've been working at for the last year and a half, uh, building a um, uh, building a large scale installation and sound piece. And what you're seeing here is a Haudenosaunee longhouse. Uh, it's a few hundred years old. Uh, it's important uh, not only for the fact uh, of its age and its, uh, but also for its location. Uh, this longhouse is located uh, in the town of Brantford, Ontario, which is just outside of the Six Nations Reserve, where I'm from. Uh, but also importantly, it's located just behind, uh, just up the hill on the other side of this longhouse is uh, Canada's oldest residential schools, uh, titled uh, the Mohawk Institute Residential School, where my grandfather went. And so this territory is contested territory. It's interesting. Uh, also, I should say on the other side of this, if you go to the left is the Mohawk Chapel, uh, which is also the place where uh, the Mohawk people um, uh, conduct treaties with the, with, the, with the crown. So this territory is really, really interesting. And so we chose it as the site for, our, for our, a lot of our work. Um, I should say that contextualizing all of this is, um, I'm just gonna show you. A couple of pieces there. Um, longhouses are important. Uh, we call ourselves uh, the Haudenosaunee, uh, otherwise known as Iroquois, but we call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, which means people of the longhouse. And longhouses are important because they, uh, you know, not only are they functional living structures uh, built out of materials that we would have had around at the time, they're also symbolic of our uh, Haudenosaunee or our kind of spiritual way of life. Uh, so they show not only how we live together uh, as families, as groups, as clans, but also um, they, it's how we conduct ourselves in a kind of democratic way, how we um, conduct ourselves uh, through sharing and different kinds of relationships and our interconnectedness with the land and the place. So much of my work has been about, uh, about place and about that location, making site-specific pieces, um, uh, thinking very differently than maybe I had early on in my career, which um, where I would go to a location, maybe I'd be shooting a documentary or I'd be even gathering stuff and creating an installation in an art gallery. Uh, a few years ago, it became really, really important to me to start working site specifically. And uh, instead of thinking about my work as uh, in documentary or otherwise as being extractive uh, in the sense where I would take things from a site and bring it into an art gallery or I would record stuff and make something out of it. Um, this whole thing was about trying to create a reciprocal relationship with this location. And uh, so what you're seeing here is our plans to develop a VR space uh, inside the longhouse, uh, you know, typical multi-speaker setup with ambisonic sound and uh, some projection technology. So uh, essentially doing video mapping. And we've created some of our own software to do some of this uh, to um, uh, to be able to sort of work with it in the way that we wanted to work with it. Um, we're also uh, video mapping the outside of the space. So the whole idea is to create this virtual environment that's sort of layered on top of the actual location. Um, the idea being that uh, uh, we want to hold a gathering. And so, uh, you know, as we all have found ourselves in the last year in this global moment, uh, a lot of conversations have been had about you know, taking this piece and reworking it for a for a VR headset or some other thing, and uh, we've chosen instead to postpone everything, um, uh, push everything back to the time where we can actually produce this piece in the way we wanted to, which was actually at the location, actually on site, and to have many people there uh, having a kind of collective experience rather than something that would just be sort of an individual experience inside a VR uh, world headset, and have something also that would be conducted on site. So something that was connected to that space. And so we've uh, we've been working really hard to sort of build up that stuff. Uh, a lot of this work has been conducted in community, like I said. Uh, this is just us doing some green screen shooting with some drummers back home in our territory. And uh, the whole idea was to, uh, much like you might in a kind of a traditional kind of documentary format, we're working with everybody in the community. This has not been sort of conceived of as a singular uh, artistic vision, but uh, rather as a kind of hopeful kind of collective vision, uh, thinking about our stories as Haudenosaunee people, how we tell our stories, and how those relate to documentary. Uh, I like to think in a way that Haudenosaunee people have always been documentary makers. Um, we just have a different term for it. We think about it as storytelling. And, uh, you know, for since time immemorial, we've been telling our stories 
uh, of course, um, uh, by talking to each other, by sort of speaking those stories in our ceremonies and our longhouses, but we also tell stories through song, tell stories through dance. Um, and um, I consider a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last few years as a way to contribute to that storytelling and uh, as a way to sort of continue our progress and our, and, our, and our ideas. And I started off by saying that a lot of our work is about um, transformation and, and uh, through storytelling. Uh, which is how we think about it. We think about our stories as Haudenosaunee people, not as something fixed in time, but as something that is ever evolving and something that is connected with place. Uh, and just for the sake of time, I just want to end with this kind of uh, last uh, last piece I just wanted to say while I play this uh, little looping video here. Here's just a kind of virtual model of the longhouse. Um, that for us, that uh, most of our traditional teachings come from this idea that uh, history, cultural memory, story and knowledge is something written on the landscape and that for us the land is something animate it's alive it's living it's a kind of embodied archive and so for a long time i've been thinking about this idea that uh, the term coined by vine deloria called spatial storytelling which really thinks about this as our stories as being something embedded in place not something necessary that's just durational but actually has dimensional so when we walk this landscape, when we walk this territory, this area where this longhouse is, we are actually immersed in our history, immersed in our story. And so it's through that idea, this idea of animating landscape, animating story that this work comes from um, and trying to find new ways, digital technology ways to essentially been, do what we've been doing since time immemorial, which is uh, being documentary people, being storytellers. Wonderful. Thank you Thank so you. much, Jackson. Um, we're going to go next up to Halsey Bergend, who's going to present his work. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you, Jackson. Wow, that was incredible. And thank you, ODL, for having me here. And uh, it's, a real, it's a real honor to be a part of this, uh, of this panel. So I'm just going to jump right in. Hopefully, you can see my slides. Um, if you can, you will notice that uh, my work is actually all about augmentation for the ears, not, not for the eyes. Um, and it is also an augmentation that allows for contributions from the public. Um, and as such, um, my sort of form of augmentation evolves over time. So uh, in this brief uh, presentation, I'm gonna take you through the sort of what of my practice, the why uh, per Sarah's question, and then sort of how, how I um, jump into these uh, these uh, installations and how I create them. And, um, and then at the end, I'll share a, a project example um, which illustrates my approach. So uh, what, what do I do in, in 30 seconds? As I said, I, I augment um, place with audio. I'm a, a sound artist and a composer. Um, so I create, um, create space-based compositions that essentially proceed through time based on how a listener navigates a physical landscape rather than proceeding in sort of a fixed way through time as most music does from the beginning to the middle to the end, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, whatever. My, my work really depends on how somebody navigates a physical space to hear their own unique version of the work. And in addition to the musical landscape that I create, I also, as mentioned, allow participants to use their mobile devices to make their own recordings and add them to the piece in real time. Um, I like to think of this sort of as augmenting the current participants experience with the experiences of previous participants. So why, why do I do this? It's always sort of interesting to be asked this question because often it just sort of seems obvious in my own head, but when I, when I think about it, um, there are actually quite a lot of reasons. And so some of them I've outlined here. Um, I think the technology often has the effect of removing us from the real world. You know, we live in our phones and the internet in so many ways, especially, you know, during this 15 months of pandemic, we're particularly, I think, um, confined to our technology, um, which, which, you know, I think can be somewhat problematic. But of course, technology can do some amazing things and it can reach out and connect and all of that. So I hope that my work can take advantage of, of you know, distant connections to other people, information and data that technology can afford while also connecting people to their immediate physical surroundings and you know, create some kind of hybrid enhanced experience between 
you know, what's immediately around you and an enhancement that sort of comes from either other places or other times. I also really love the idea of revealing hidden stories that all places have associated with them. Jackson referred to some of this uh, as well. Um, you know, all places have stories, whether they're personal or historical, you know, personal narratives, historical events, et cetera, that can be fascinating for others to talk about. Also, I just think people have very, very strong connections to place. And, um, you know, they bring up places can bring up memories and, and whatnot. And sharing all of those uh, sort of stories and memories with each other perspectives um, is really fascinating and provides me with a lot of inspiration for, for my work. Um, and finally, I think there's something really interesting about connecting people asynchronously. If you listen to a voice of somebody else who stood right in the place where you're standing now, but they stood there in the past and they, they made a recording, it's really fascinating to think about that sort of compression of time. And then as you leave a recording for somebody in the future, you're kind of speaking to the future in a sense. And um, you know, I love this sort of idea of, again, compressing time and, and, and bringing the past and the future into the present in this sort of interesting way. So on to the how. Um, I create experiences. I'm going to talk about that a little more. Um, in, in, but basically, I, I certainly take advantage of all of the uh, current technical infrastructure that we have uh, in our modern lives, you know, mobile apps and devices, um, you know, GPS, the cloud, et cetera. But when I started doing this work about 12 or so years ago, nothing really existed to create you know, an audio landscape, um, as I've been referring to. And I had to, therefore, create my own, my own platform. And uh, I, did, I did that. It's been evolving over, over time at the platform. And it's, it's, uh, I'm going to get into how, how that works. Um, so an example. This is a project called bog people, as you can see here. And um, a few years back, I was actually introduced through ODL, actually, to a group called the Living Observatory. Um, and they were undertaking a massive project down in southern uh, Massachusetts to restore a cranberry bog from an agricultural landscape into its former, more natural, you know, un, un, uh, you know unchanged by human um, activity state. I was really fascinated by this idea. So I sort of joined up with, with this group and, and my role is to essentially capture and, and document, if you will, all of the different people involved in this transition, in, in this transformation, you know, from the guys driving the backhoes to the scientists, to the cranberry farmers who've been farming the land for years and years, to people who walk their dog on the property and, and sort of capture all of their experiences while this transformation was happening. And, um, and then, go on to share these experiences um, in the locations that are most pertinent, most relevant to those experiences themselves. So that future folks walking around this area in its newly transformed state can experience some of the transformation that happened and, um, and then share their own stories as well. So this is uh, a, an aerial view of a member uh, called Tid Marms. And the first thing I did was overlay the landscape with a number of sections of a musical composition that I created you know, for this based on the landscape. You can see these polygons, these crazy polygon shapes. Um, each of those contains a different set of, uh, a different part of the musical piece. And where the polygons overlap each other, that's where two sections of the piece would be heard um, you know, if you were walking through that space. The, the polygons sort of fade out to the edges um, and, and whatnot. So you can see if there's some sort of straight, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's some more straight right angle type channels. Those represent the old uh, agricultural channels. And then the more new uh, sort of sinuous channels represent the, um, the new, more natural look. So I was trying to kind of play with the old versus the new there and, and reveal some of these hidden stories as I was referring to before of what the landscape used to contain. And then in addition to, um, the musical part, uh, you can see these small blue circles here, and those represent voices that I sort of sprinkled throughout the landscape. These are um, both excerpts from interviews that I did with various people involved in the project, as well as recordings that participants make when they are on site themselves and listening and reacting and, and, and whatnot uh, using, you know, using their mobile devices. So <clears throat> the participant recordings, when a participant makes a recording, just to be clear, they the recording they make is sort of located where they are when they made the recording. So it becomes this sort of you know, audio graffiti, if you will, of that particular 
location and future participants can then hear what they did. So in summary- My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, my watch just started talking to me. In summary, I augmented this uh, physical landscape here, um, this, this, this bog, this cranberry bog with the experiences of many different people with many different experience, uh, sorry, many different people with many different perspectives. I mix those with the aesthetic experience of the musical composition and then let people explore this combined visual, spatial, audio landscape as they choose by wandering in throughout the physical space however they want to. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a um, sampling of some of the audio. So rather than just try to verbally explain what I did, um, I'll go through a slideshow of a few, a few pictures of the landscape with some audio going, and then uh, that will be it. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Setting a, an ecosystem on a trajectory and then letting it go. I started cranberry farming when I was 13 and a half. Even if we did know what it was exactly before, uh, we can't put it back to that. So you guys are collecting specifically larvae of what sort of the, order? The big one here is a dragonfly, oh and gosh. this one that's wiggling around is a damselfly. They're oh, smaller. Wow. So it may very well be that in the middle of one of these peat balls is um, what David described earlier as a pipe, you know, like an old decomposed tree where groundwater comes up through oh, yeah. the peat. And, you know, maybe that's an area where there might want to be a small ponded area in the midst of that peat. Uh, so he was kind enough to let us run a, a snake cable down to the, to the edge of the water. So I'm an audio person, I can't help, the, uh, help but fade it out. Um, so hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea of what uh, my work is about and uh, thank you again. Thank you, Halsey, for that presentation. We will talk much more about it after. Um, next up, we have Glenn Kantov. Can you see and hear me? Yes. Um, okay, cool. All right, yeah. Um, well, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Glenn Kantav. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Movers and Shakers. So um, we started up as a collective. We're now a nonprofit. And our mission is that we use augmented reality to write black and brown history into American curricula. So I'm going to start off just to give you the foundation in terms of how we started. Um, and I'll show you like how AR sort of naturally came up as a use case for us. And then I'll give you a sneak peek into what we're working on. So um, yeah, we started off as a collective, um, a good artist collective focused on art and technology. And our intention uh, was to advocate for the removal of problematic statues in New York City. And so what we did was we started hosting teach-ins throughout New York City to apply pressure uh, in 2017. Uh, this was shortly after the riots happened in Charlottesville. Um, and we made like little AR installations to, that would basically distill information from thick books that most people don't read and something that we thought people would want to see. Um, and we learned pretty quickly that it was a very bureaucratic process in terms of removing monuments and statues. Um, nationwide, in terms of the scope of the issue, there's over 5,100 statues of people. There are more than 700 Confederate monuments and less than 400 are women. We could do so much better. And the scope is pretty similar in terms of, of inequitable, inequitable distribu distribution of narratives, whether it's in our media, whether it's in our uh, our public spaces, whether it's in our education systems. And so each of those in terms of changing it for a more equitable landscape is an extremely heavy lift. And so for us, that was the beginning of Kinfolk, which is also the little video behind me. Um, and so basically the way that we saw it is that if it's a bureaucratic process to get rid of monuments, um, and it's expensive to put up new ones, then we might as well just develop our own really quickly and really inexpensively and through augmented reality. The power of that is that most Americans have smartphones and can interact with this media pretty intuitively. And so basically what we're doing is we have this catalog of these black and brown figures that you don't learn about in school. Uh, um, we currently have 10 right now um, and you can, <clears throat> You can resize them, you can put them into your living room, you can go to specific places and, 
uh, superimpose them over different statutes. And so one key insight here as well is that uh, with, an, with an emerging technology like AR, like most people don't want to download their apps and AR apps tend to be pretty heavy. And you know, you're choosing between keeping pictures of your grandmother or downloading this app, you're gonna choose like one, of, one over the other, right? Uh, you're, likely to, you're likely to pick grandma. But if you are, if you introduce this information into schools, you have a guaranteed audience there where if you make it homework, they just gotta learn it. And so especially given the advent of COVID um, and uh, remote learning going up across the country, we saw a larger opportunity here to shift the minds of the next generation through our monuments. But now that things are starting to open up, um, we have also shifted over into the public engagement uh, aspect. I'll share a little video that gives you a sneak peek here. In 2021, it's no secret that our statues, our money, even our textbooks have one thing in common. They're full of white male slaveholders. Movers and Shakers is launching Kinfolk, a free app featuring augmented reality monuments of black and brown figures we should have learned about in school. We've partnered with Netflix to include four figures featured in the Men the Fight for America, a docu-series that explores the legacy of the 14th Amendment. Now, the whole family can come together and bring monuments into your living room. You can make them life-size, read their bios, and discover hidden gems through our Kinfolk web archive. Download today in your app store. And so, yeah, um, basically what we're looking to do uh, there is where we want anyone to be able to just download and experience these monuments. Um, we're fortunate to be launching our next batch of monuments this week during the Tribeca Film Festival. And so if anyone that's in New York uh, is available, you come, come by 3 p.m. We're going to have an, uh, an AR art walk uh, at three historic locations in, in New York City, starting off at Battery Park City. Uh, we'll walk past the uh, former site of the New York, slave, New York slave market for a moment of silence. We'll go to Federal Hall and then we'll finish up, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and we'll finish up at City Hall Park. Uh, where we'll be display, displaying some of our older monuments and our newer monuments and these portals and scenes where we're essentially representing moments in time um, that are pivotal to these, these figures' lives as well as the monuments themselves. But yeah, there's the school aspect and then we want to just continue to do public programming um, and make space for these conversations uh, in terms of dominant, in terms of who are the dominant narratives, um, who are the underrepresented narratives, and how can we uh, have a more equitable distribution of these narratives. Because at the end of the day, it's about a conversation that's really, that has to do with power. And we see AR as a quick and exciting way to um, peel back the layers of centuries of dehumanization. And so um, another part of it is that we'd like to take a similar approach to what's happened here in, in Richmond, Virginia, uh, where you could take projections um, of people like George Floyd and the BLM movement onto existing statues, like Robert E. Lee would have owned George Floyd if it was uh, if it, if you go back, you know. Our long term goal is to be in every classroom in America, and at the end of the day, um, it we were really centering this around the children. Um, you know, after speaking with a lot of kids through this process, one of the biggest things that we've we've learned is that a lot of children, even adults, are unaware of the fact that or forget the fact that um, progress takes time. The civil rights movement didn't happen in one night, right? And so it was a dec it was an over decade long process. So we see what happened over the summer and we see that there's been momentum that slowed, but um, you know things ebb and flow in different ways. And we honestly don't know how to have a lot of conversations about equity and humanizing others and generosity in this country because of the narratives that have been excluded, historically excluded. And there are models that exist. And we think that it, we think that those models need to be front and center in the archive for everyone to see. And we think that AR is a tool to do so. So I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Look forward to discussing more. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, last up is Tamiko, Tamiko Theo. 
Okay. So thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's really interesting um, to hear all this context because it fits very well with uh, my own work. Just really quick, uh, um, I I had been working for in virtual reality since the mid '90s. And then in 2010, out of the blue, got a, um, an invitation to it, help invade MoMA, New York. Uh, my piece, uh, Art Critic Face Matrix, was in a matrix of faces sort of screaming in denial that AR would ever become art. And um, uh, we got a fair amount of not notoriety because uh, the intervention was, was a, an official part of a conflicts festival of psychogeography in New York. Work. And the, the person who tweeted for Museum of Modern Art found that out. They probably just read it in the program and tweeted the day before we did the intervention, which was, of course, great publicity. And the, the idea that back in 2010 that you could place your own art wherever you wanted in, in the world was so liberating that we formed a group called Manifest.AR. Um, and uh, uh, our manifesto was quoted briefly by, by William at the beginning. Um, uh, the year after our intervention at MoMA, I led our intervention into the Venice Biennial. Here is uh, a work Shades of Absence on, on um, artists whose public works of art in, the, in Venice were censored. And basically, those two interventions really sort of got us into the media art um, history books. In my VR work and my AR work, I draw very much on my uh, father, Philip Thiel's work. He studied at MIT architecture under Kevin Lynch and Jury Kepish on the perception of the environment through the eyes of a person moving through the space. So first person, what I call experiential viewpoint, which of course, uh, virtual reality has now really brought into the discussion with, uh, with um, his idea as an architect of the anatomy of space being not just the physical space, but the, the various uh, often uh, built by human or, or natural features that turn it into a place. And then very important occasion, what's happening at that place at that time. And for me, uh, augmented reality is a way of bringing perhaps those, uh, those different types of occasions, what's happened at that one place to the fore. Um, I did a lot of my own work but um, there's, all, uh, but I specifically wanted to talk about working with communities as an AR artistic advisor. Back in 2012, I met uh, the um, director of the Caribbean Cultural Center and African Diaspora Institute in East Harlem, and she asked me to uh, uh, basically train their local artists to do AR in East Harlem. You might know that the uh, Puerto Rican Afro-Caribbean uh, um, culture there is being pushed out by gentrification. So for instance, Oliver Rios is one artist who grew up in the area, um, was doing a graffiti art, but also documenting not only his, but other people's art also. So he used the AR app to put uh, the documentation he had taken back onto the walls where most of it had already been erased, or maybe the building had also been erased. Uh, Yasmin Hernandez uh, put a Taino, uh, the indigenous people of Puerto Rico, uh, a Taino ceremonial uh, bateas in the middle of the Taino Towers, which is a social housing building uh, right in East Harlem. And then there, there was a number of others, but um, just as a, you know, as a person who's not belonging to the community, when they asked me to uh, make a piece, uh, contribute a piece, then, then I asked them to, uh, to send out a questionnaire and ask people to write in their own handwriting and sign their names, what makes El Barrio feel like home to them. And then when you scan the uh, facade of the, of the, of the uh, uh, CCC ADI building, then it comes up around you and surrounds you with the voice of the community. So um, after doing that piece, I was asked to do a piece in Seattle for the Wing Luke um, uh, Asian American Museum and really wanted to do a piece looking very personally at my own history as a third generation Japanese American in the Seattle Puget Sound area. I sat down with my mother and we came up with 18 sites around the city that were really meaningful, um, partially to, to us uh, as a family and partially to uh, the Japanese American community. So just like 
a uh, lot of East Asian art is a landscape augmented with calligraphy. I asked my mother, who's a master calligrapher and prize winning calligrapher in both Japan and the US to make calligraphies that were appropriate to each of these sites. And then I turned them again into golden, uh, golden calligraphies and positioned them with geolocative AR at those sites. Some of them ones where you think there's no connection, uh, but it turns out, for instance, the Space Needle was partially designed by the very friend of my father who invited him to come to Seattle uh, uh, for an architecture professorship. And this fountain, the international fountain, was actually built by Japanese architect friends of ours that we knew from Japan. And the, uh, during the course of this, I found out that the Pike Place Market was also where my great grandfather and grandfather um, sold the produce that that they farmed uh, south of, of the Puget Sound, something that I hadn't known before. And um, and then, of course, there's a lot of sites around uh, the Nihonmachi, the uh, Japantown part of Seattle, that look very prosaic, shall we say, but are very important to the community, like Bush Gardens, where um, the community banquets were held. Uh, it turns out that my family was also in, um, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. The, my grandfather's side of the family was around Puget Sound. My grandmother's side, uh, here you see her as a baby being brought back uh, from the hospital in, around in Sunnyvale where she was born. And so a, a friend of mine, uh, Susan Hayase, had, um, asked me to put uh, Brush the Sky in the San Jose, Japan town as a demonstration project for her to be able to motivate the community to do a project on the cultural history of uh, uh, San Jose, Japantown. So, um, so it turns out that the uh, San Jose, Japantown started out as Heinlandville, a Chinese, uh, a Chinese neighborhood, and then uh, evolved over, over the uh, decades to include both uh, Japanese and, and the Filipino. So, uh, so the hidden histories of San Jose, Japantown really refers to the fact that Japantown is not just a Japanese American, but also Chinese American, Filipino American. They selected um, nine artists and it's really wonderful that in these days, many of these artists also express these multiple heritages in themselves because you know, the, the one, one parent is one ethnicity and the other is the other. Um, and um, we, we can't, <laughs> the project is opening this Saturday and the works are still in a constant state of flux. So I don't have anything that I can show you next week. I, I, I would have, but it's a little bit early. Um, but I wanted to just then mention that the platform they're using is one that I and, and my husband, Peter Graf, developed in 2018, 2019, when the platform that I had been using since 2010 um, announced uh, essentially in the middle of a commission that I got from the Whitney Museum Layer said, we'll be closing down our servers at the end of the year. You can't use our piece for an exhibit that goes into next year. And Peter had been watching. We, we knew this was going to happen at some point. I've seen about five other platforms close over that time. So um, Peter said, OK, I'll try uh, to create a new platform uh, for you in one month. And if I can do that, we can take the Whitney Commission. Well, it worked. We made it open source. It's uh, being it's archived in the Whitney with the piece and expected growth that we made for the Whitney Commission. It's in the uh, GitHub Arctic, Arctic um, uh, Code Vault, and um, it's the idea is that we're trying to develop a community that will be using it with developers who can help us develop it. So we're completely independent from the commercial companies that pop up and may offer a nicer interface, but um, might also vanish overnight. So um, those are uh, the contributions that I wanted to talk about and thank you very much for your attention. Wow, thank you everyone. Those were amazing presentations and examples of incredibly inspiring examples of what can be done with AR in place. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Tamiko. Um, you, you clearly have an incredible uh, wealth of experience augmenting places. 
Um, how do you approach your work when you're entering a place which is already mediated with signs and monuments, storefronts, and full of a lot of live variables, uh, people, activity, weather, competing attentions? How do you start when you're using places or canvas? It's very much a matter of researching for me the the history of the place. It depends, of course, on what the what the uh, what the theme of the exhibit is. Um, you know, certainly. Um, uh, certainly, with something like the the brush the sky piece in Seattle, it was it was really saying um, what are the places that have uh, emotional value uh, to to us, and then and then trying to understand uh, layers layers of of history that that were affected by by that. It's it's actually um, very similar to what uh, Jackson was saying in in the first article I wrote on on um, AR is saying that, look, augmented reality as a technology is merely the latest way of doing storytelling and that we've been augmenting it. I mean, this is all just repeating what Jackson said. We've been augmenting the, uh, the entire world since the first time when one person said to another person, you know what happened here? And those are, of course, the stories that um, that that he was talking about. Um, but that's also that's also the the way that um, that you know you you dive into any one single place and try and understand what are the layers that are there, but maybe not uh, publicized or talked about or known. So very specifically, I'm interested in, um, as sort of the name that I gave to the project in San Jose, the hidden histories that don't, um, just as Glenn uh, was saying, um, the ones that do not get the public limelight, but are there and are very, very important to other communities that know those histories and want to um, bring it to the fore for a larger audience. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting how we can do that with this new technology. And that leads me to you, Glenn. Um, in an interview to Hypoallergic, um, you said you initially started using the app as a way to circumvent a lot of the red tape that exists in taking down monuments and erecting new ones. Um, the beauty said the beauty of this technology is that we could put up our own stories with or without permission from an institution. So that gets to that point of really being able to take these stories and, and show them. Um, it's really exciting. But it's clear in your work too, you've worked very hard to find audiences because when, when you're not attached to an institution, you have that issue of, well, then how do people see it? How do you get out? How do you get it out there? So um, can you talk about that a little in your practice and how you think about that? Yeah, I mean, there is certainly, there's certainly a, a graveyard of dead augmented reality apps. Um, everyone knows it in the industry. Um, and so like that was the that was the first thing it was like um going back to the why ar question um you know as i was saying in the presentation most americans have smartphones it's it's accessible it's speaks in a language in a, a visual language that kids intuitively understand they're they spend their time you know playing video games and they're on snapchat and they're on, they're playing fortnite they're on tiktok um so we wanted to sort of mirror that um so that the youth could get involved with it um, but at the same time, as we've shifted over to the education space for that guaranteed audience, um, there is a major breadth of issues there as well. Um, one of them being that um, just the nature of what we're doing um, is threatening to uh, white male dominated schools of thought and institutions. There have been uh, cases where, for example, there was a school in the South uh, in, North, in North Carolina that we wanted to work with. And we got in at the teacher level. The teachers were really excited. Um, but when the principal delivered our idea to uh, the board, the board in, in, uh, immediately said that they had no interest in, um, they had no interest in like introducing kinfolk be, to the schools because they were afraid of the reaction from the parents. They were afraid that we would be replacing history which we never spoke to but that just speaks to the whole um that speaks to white fragility in a nutshell um so there's definitely there's definitely a major battle going on right now in terms of the critical race theory conversation what nicole hannah jones the 1619 project is facing 
um, against our Senate, right? Um, so from a, from a content perspective as well, it's definitely, there are definitely major hurdles that we're going to have to circumvent. And the reality is that we're going to have to start preaching to the choir regardless, because there is a breadth of um, open-minded teachers who are who have told us that they're looking for content, that they're starving for content in different ways to engage their students. And so um, we, the app tends to give two different reactions. Um, there are no lukewarm users. It's either you love it or you're threatened by it. Mm -hmm. And so learning to navigate that space is a learning experience that we're going through right now. So if anyone has ideas on that, please uh, reach out and let me know. Wow, yeah. It's a, it's a challenge, it's a really hard to <laughs> these kind of changes. But it's interesting with apps, it feels like, yeah, you can infiltrate a little more. Um, Jackson, in, in your project, um, you talk about exploring the spatiality of storytelling and how stories can be dimensional as well as durational, how narratives are intricately interconnected with place and the landscape. But at the same time, you're also exploring bringing these indigenous cultures and practices to the digital space. What are some of the ways the stories are different dimension, um, dimensionally and spatially when told and experienced on the land versus in digital space? What are you finding in your research? Hi, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, it seems like a lot of um, conversation has been had over, you know, past decade or more. Um, I mean, I think there's our, our knowledge keepers and our, 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 our elders. And in fact, knowledge keepers isn't quite the right word because, um, you know, the people in our communities that, that have stories, that hold our stories, that... Um, uh, translate the, the whole idea is that this idea of sharing and passing that knowledge on and, and sharing it with community. And so uh, we have in our communities been faced with that challenge in the last year. And that it seems like this last year has accelerated that. I mean, I, I teach classes here at the university and, and normally we have elders, knowledge keepers coming in and uh, we're able to create uh, a space for them to come and share stories and knowledge with us. And normally when people come, our elders come to our classrooms, uh, you know, we don't record our, 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 our sessions or anything like that, because the whole idea typically is that what's shared at that time is, um, you know, meant for those people in the room at that time, at that moment. Uh, you know, you'll even hear some of our elders say sometimes they'll say, well, uh, you know, I've got this really great story to tell you, but, you know, it's going to take me three days to tell you. And we have to actually go over by Chief Mountain. That's where that story is. So there's something really connected to a relational communication with people at place at time but also with location sometimes you literally have to go to that space um, but I think what's happening now is that there's uh, the knowledge keepers still see that responsibility of passing that on and I think now there's people are really seeing the potential of VR spaces and other things and its potential to create those shared um, spaces and environments, and now really kind of taking that on as a, as a new way of, again, as Tomiko rightly kind of said, and I, I will echo again, is this uh, finding new tools and technologies to tell our stories and allowing those things to transform and shift and change and, and finding new ways, again, to communicate. Because the, the core part of it is that that knowledge needs to be passed on. You know, our, our keepers don't keep that knowledge. It needs to be transferred. And if these are the new ways to do it, uh, I see nothing but people embracing that uh, for the most part um, and connecting it to place. And then of course, finding ways to do that. I mean, um, there's another project I'm working on right now with uh, uh, some Blackfoot elders here in our territory and we're scanning objects uh, mm -hmm. that are kept in some of the British museums. And we're having these ongoing conversations about what does it mean to scan sacred objects, medicine bundles, for instance, can we, can we not do that? So. Um, there's just to say that there's conversation around advancing our protocols uh, in our communities to say, well, these are new technologies. What do we need to do to understand them? How can we protect, uh, you know, where we come from with these, with our knowledges, but at the same time, you know, uh, use them for ourselves in order to transform um, some of those spaces. Yeah. Um, and speaking of tools, I mean, we have a couple of people on this panel who have created their own tools. I mean, these tools are what's exciting and, and can allow for all these new interactions and, and audiences, but they also, some of them are fraught. Um, so Halsey and Tomiko, I know you both have 
created new tools in housing, of course, roundware. But what problem were you addressing with those existing tools that are out there, the augmented reality tools? There's Hi, a... I... Go ahead. Oh, OK, OK, <laughs> thanks. Um, as far as, uh, yeah, when I, when I started building roundware, it was, I think, 12 years ago. And at the time, there really was, I mean, the, the, the iPhone, you know, 3GS had like just come out, which meant that there was just, you know, just the ability for people to have a mobile device that sort of knew the location. And therefore, I think as a result of that sort of nascent um, hardware, there wasn't, there really wasn't any any software that I was aware of that would um, that would allow me to, you know, to sort of implement this vision that I had of of that the first implementation of this was at a sculpture park outside of Boston, and and I wanted to you know cover it with this composition and allow people to contribute to that, and there really was nothing that existed at the time. Um, obviously, all the infrastructure you know infrastructural stuff existed, like the GPS satellites were there. That was handy, and you know I could use iPhones and whatnot. But there was no um, there was there was really nothing that came even close to allowing me to do it. So I, I, I like to say I was trying to solve an art problem by you know by building this by building this software sort of from um, you know again it's software is never from scratch because we're always standing on the shoulders of the previous you know giants of the software industry and soft you know amazing open source developers etc who have built all the packages that we, we use but I kind of cobbled those together to try to make something that would you know initially really just solve my own personal desire to create this this um, this this piece and then as I got into doing that I became more and more interested and enamored with the idea of making the tool as sort of broadly accessible as possible. I open sourced it and allow other people to, you know, add to it and, and you know, rising tide, you know, raises all boats and, and allowing other people to come in and, and use it for their own purposes. And it's been pretty fascinating what other folks have done. I just had a call with a, you know, an immersive theater group the other day who wants to, you know, bring one of their theater productions out into the, into the streets of their city and, you know, I've, I've worked with the Smithsonian a lot about collecting um, sort of casual culture, if you will, from people around America um, so the Smithsonian can archive some of that stuff. So there's all these amazing uses that I never sort of really dreamed of, which to me is very, very inspiring. And it's, uh, it's, it's I think, one of the benefits I get from, you know, from sharing this and from uh, trying to continue to, to make it better. Um, Tamika, yes, love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, when I started working with AR, um, uh, there was uh, we started using the Layar app that was a commercial company coming out of um, Amsterdam, and and so uh, basically as long as that app worked, and um, I just stayed with uh, with that, and so our our own open source app is. Uh, is a lot younger, and I'm sure hoping that um, it'll develop the sort of uh, user base you talked about that uh, that comes up with uses and and developments uh, in the in the technology of the app that that uh, we didn't think of, um, and we're really hoping that can happen. But uh, as as I said, um, we're just now, I mean, like in the last couple months, getting to the point where we think uh, there's some people who are able to contribute uh, to that to that development. So um, so so for us, I, I explained that there was this critical moment when we had the most high profile commission we had had yet uh, from the Whitney Museum, and it was either all or nothing because there weren't weren't any other apps available beyond the layer app that could make a uh, installation uh, geolocative installation that would uh, um, cover the in entire sixth floor terrace of the Whitney. And, um, and so for us, it was very, very critical that we have a, an app that, um, that, uh, that is under our own control that we can migrate. And we're actually like doing one migration already now from one that was purely geolocative to one that's based on ARKit. ARCore can do uh, not only geolocative, but image trigger and also the SLAM, the, where you're 
placing 3D objects really in space and you can walk walk around them. Um, and you know, in, in the course of that time, I'd seen, for instance, uh, the, the Google Tangle. You, th you think with these large companies like Google and Apple, you know, when Google brings out something, you, you say, okay, you know, the company is not going to vanish overnight. Well, guess what? Uh, they had the Google Tango AR platform for like a couple of years and they even bought um, one device purely in order to use it. And then they said, okay, we're discontinuing that because we have a completely different platform, AR Core, that's much better and it's not compatible. So any devices and any artworks you made with Tango do not exist anymore. So, so this longevity was very, very important, but also something that we brought over from Layer is the fact that, um, I figured who, who mentioned it, but um, a lot of the AR apps um, have all the content inside the app, which means, uh, you know, your download is maybe 150 megabytes or more. And I've just all too often been there when, you know, uh, young people are standing there saying, oh, I don't have space. You know, I'd have to delete my grandmother's, uh, the video of my grandmother's birthday party, um, or I don't have the data rate that allows me to d download that much. So, um, so one thing we, um, we borrowed from Layer's concept was separating the core app itself from the content. And the content um, is then downloaded when you open up what we, we call a layer, uh, one single um, uh, project on the Arpoise app, then the content is downloaded and we um, it has to be kind of under five, uh, five uh, megabytes per sort of uh, piece of the content. Otherwise it doesn't download in time and it times out. But what that means is that, um, you know, this can be expanded, this app can be expanded exponentially if you were because you know if every person in the world was making a different one then then you know you're just downloading their uh, content separately uh, for uh, for in order to look at their art project and um, and the other part the other difficulty of dealing with apps as any app developer knows is the Apple App Store because um, you you have a wonderful concept and you've uh, it's been a commission from a, from an art museum and and you think okay um, this will go through the App Store in 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 simply hours and then they come back and they say we don't find adequate gameplay you do not provide interesting enough content for our audience please completely rewrite your entire app and resubmit it. And so, um, so the thing is that, um, you know, it took us uh, the first several times, um, uh, several weeks in order to update the app. And if you can imagine you've got a deadline and you're late and, um, you know, it's, and, and then you find a horrible bug and guess what, tomorrow is your opening and you can't update things in time. But um, with but with the app separated from the content, then um, we are responsible uh, for keeping the app up uh, in the stores, um, keeping it updated. Because guess what? Apple and Google a couple times a year make updates that kind of break the app. So you have to then go through this process. And imagine if every single artist making every single artwork had to update their own app. Well. We have like one platform, and the different artists can um, update it separately. Uh, uh, have can only only have to update their content, and they don't have to update the app separately. So, so those are a couple of, of the considerations that really went into designing this this platform as a way to enable uh, a light app. Um, that the artists didn't have to put through the app stores themselves. They didn't have to become Apple uh, and, and Google developers themselves in order to use the app. You still need to be very savvy in creating the media art, art content, but, um, but uh, that separation is we, we find to be very important. Great. And I know you want people to use it. So AR Poise is the name if people want to um, use it for their apps. There's a bunch of questions from the audience. So I'm going to take a few of those. Uh, we have one from Adam Gantz. He says, I want to ask the panel what they see as the difference in the kinds of relationships created with audience participants by using place-based material in this amazing ways that you guys have shown. Is this still storytelling or is it something different? 
perhaps at least um, as interesting as example, Rick Prelinger has recently argued in World Records Journal for everyone's um, knowledge that he, he talked about his live theater where he would put up films that were in and the audience would narrate them as they went along. But who wants to take that question? Any takers? Um, the different kinds of relationships created with audiences and participants. Um, is it still storytelling what you're doing or is it something different? I, <clears throat> I'm not gonna pretend that I have an actual solid answer to this, but I do, I do think about it a lot. I, I, I think about, you know, because my work really can't be linear in the sense that I can't control in most cases how somebody walks through a space, I have to think about sort of storytelling, quote unquote, in a non-linear way. So it's more kind of world building in a sense of sort of creating a feel and a, and a you know, sort of representation of, of, a, of, a, of a topic and a space and, a, and, and whatnot, rather than here's the beginning, here's the middle, and here's the end. And, um, and you know, so I've come up with various methodologies to kind of try to, uh, you know, get across whatever it is that I'm trying to get across in a particular project. But, um, you know, the fact that, that my audience, so to speak, hopefully is adding to it as well, really kind of complicates matters even more in terms of telling a story. But again, if I think of it more in terms of building a world and doc and sort of documenting and, 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 and sharing this, um, this, this augmented space rather than telling a specific story, um, then that feels right to me. It works for me, but, um, I don't know, I, I, it's probably more documentary than storytelling in a certain sense, but that really depends on your definitions, I think. Right, yeah. Um, we have another question here about funding, which is always something that comes up um, from John Moody. Can the panels talk a little bit about financing and how they've managed to fund de development of these technologies, but I guess also the projects? If anyone wants to share any <laughs> ideas or ways that it is being funding, this uh, this kind of work is being funded or ways it should be or could be. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to jump in, be yeah, the one Glenn. always jumping in, but I have a, sorry, did somebody else have something? Yeah, Glenn, why don't we Oh, go to Glenn, that? great, go ahead, yes. Yeah. Um, so for us, it's been primarily grants. Um, and it's about like the name of the game have been like grants, grants, and more grants. But um, the way that we the way that we've approached like foundations and grants, as well as positioning ourselves as like Kinfolk isn't just a product, but Kinfolk is like a sustainable um, like nonprofit. And so, um, with that being said, like there are a lot of foundations right now. Um, that are more interested in like figuring out how to like start something and not necessarily sustain it for until the problem is solved, which could take centuries, right? Um, so like we've been like very intentional about, about um, developing a business model um, that makes sense uh, where, you know, the grant could be like an infusion of cash for a social good, but then at the end of the day, like it would sustain itself. And so to that end, we've been, um, We've been fortunate to be a part of several incubators and accelerators, um, and not your not your traditional, you know, like venture capitalist bay, uh, backed, you know, ten x return type of incubators, but more uh, the intersection of like art and technology um, and designs. So for example, um, yeah, New Ink, at, uh, New Ink, sponsored by the New Museum in New York, has been instrumental for us. Um, I Beam, um, an artist residency through in based in Bushwick. Uh, the Fast Forward Accelerator, Visible Connect, Camelback, there have been a few. Um, but yeah, so basically the TL, too long didn't read, like find a sustainable business model um, for your project and then apply to everything that even smells like it could be a, um, there could be a connection. Great. Um, Halsey, did you wanna say something? I just real quick, I would jump, I would uh, piggyback with what Glenn said about finding a sustainable business model. And, you know, in my case, the deployment of the technology of, of roundware for other folks who want to use it for different purposes and find it easier to pay me to do it than to, um, than to do it themselves, even though they could because it's open source, that has uh, been quite a sustaining um, thing for me. But um, yeah, so we'll pick that. 
Great. Um, we have a question here about access from David Thames. It said, he says, it's crucial for artists and all citizens for that matter to have access to platforms. However, unlike the web, mobile apps are totally dependent on corporate gatekeepers. We talked about that, Tomiko, Apple, iPhone, Google, Android. How do we assure that artists and resistant voices can continue to participate in free speech and free expression in this media, media ecosystem? Jackson, do you want to <laughs> take this? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I'll just say what came to my mind. I don't know if this is directly going to answer this question, but something that comes to mind from my perspective. Um, so uh, back in 1990, an Indigenous artist by the name of Lawrence Paul Luxelopshin created a VR artwork uh, for our BAMP Center. And um, alongside this piece, which was uh, an important piece unto itself, it was uh, sort of immersed you in this Coast Salish longhouse ceremony, the sacred space. And so it was interesting unto itself, but, uh, but what it made me, this question made me think about was uh, an essay by uh, an, another indigenous writer named Loretta Todd, who was talking about, at, again, early as 1990 and using terms like cyberspace and, and all this was uh, asked this crucial foundational question that I think many of us uh, indigenous artists working today think about still, which is, she asked this question about, uh, really about the digital divide, about access to technology, but further than that, not just, you know, e economics and other stuff, she posed the question about the ability of digital technologies to reinforce, reinstall colonial uh, ide ideologies of oppression, uh, et cetera. And so, I think my mind always goes back to sort of even a deeper question about technologies and digital technologies themselves. Yes, and in, in it's evidenced, of course, in apps and, and how those are controlled by corporations and various things. Uh, but I think even even more so than that is is the ability of our technologies at the at the very source of code. There's a there's um, an artist that maybe some of you know by the name of Jason Lewis out of Concordia University, uh, who's uh, both a computer scientist and, and a cultural theorist and has been thinking for a long time really about the root of code itself and how technology really embeds, you know, really a worldview and, and a worldview that has, you know, for the past several hundred years, uh, a world, a, a deeply colonial worldview that for that has sought to um, oppress whole peoples and and so um, I think my mind kind of goes to that. And so I think there's deeper questions there to be sort of thought about in terms of how we think about our digital technologies and, and those spaces that need to be reevaluated. Jason Lewis, for instance, proposes the idea of writing code in, in indigenous languages instead of in, uh, you know, the languages that we're usually normally used to. The idea of breaking away from binary languages, which I know is something, say, quantum, not, not anything I can speak intelligently on, but say quantum computing that does that goes beyond those binary definitions, which are sort of more in line with how we how indigenous people see the world and, and see uh, uh, sort of in line with our cosmology. So anyway, that maybe doesn't at all answer those questions, but just my mind sort of goes goes to that sort of space in thinking about those uh, thinking about those things. Yeah, access is such a huge question. Yeah. Yeah. Think about. Um, so we have a question here from Patsy um, Bowden, who says, how do you think of long-term cultural preservation, given the performance ephemeral nature of your augmentations, never mind the, the unstable platforms, but the, the projects themselves? Um, anyone want to take that one? Uh, Tomiko, yeah. I think the um, the hidden histories is an interesting example because um, they are you know in order to do the project um, they did uh, started doing substantial oral histories and you know making recordings and and as are building up uh, all sorts of uh, content uh, I mean a whole content database and archive on on materials so um, this was a a chance to um, to uh, create this storehouse of 
uh, local knowledge in, in three different Asian American communities that apparently hadn't been gathered in that area before. And, um, and the artworks, the, the, the artists um, met with, you know, elders from the three communities, um, listened to their uh, stories and, and worked out their concepts, had their concepts also sort of vetted by, by those uh, elders uh, so that, so that um, the, the artworks from very many of the artists you probably noticed were, were, were pretty young. Um, some were pretty old, um, but um, but uh, all of the stories then carry on a certain amount of uh, these this community storytelling, and. Um, and you know, I've been in, involved with the issue of, of archiving and conservation of, of AR. Um, you know, because our, our piece is being archived by the Whitney, and so we've been discussing uh, how that uh, needs needs to happen. And um, and that conversation is happening then in a lot of uh, uh, museums. Um, um, really in, in, in many different countries. So I think uh, so. So a lot of uh, and a lot of that is is goes beyond the purely um, the purely uh, sort of functional. Okay, uh, you know, can this image as a JPEG be preserved um, as it, as it changes? Can uh, can this uh, you know can this file format be preserved? And um, and starts recording down the artist's intent uh, of of how the piece should be experienced, so that uh, in in you know. 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, uh, when it's really clear that the technology we have right now doesn't exist, then, then you know, the, the stories essentially of the artist's intent plus the, uh, the image and video documentation, the audio documentation, which where we, we do have uh, kind of no understood ways of preserving that, um, can can be preserved as a record that can be used to rebuild um, the uh, the work in the future. The ideal thing, also, of course, being not that after a hundred years you rebuild it completely, but um, but that um, steps along the way uh, you are migrating it to a platform, which is much much easier to do these small steps. So so um, so that's part of also the, the you know the the concept of what we're thinking of um, as we're developing this app also is 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 also uh, the the best practices for um, for maintaining uh, your artworks that you might be uh, building using this platform. I'll be succinct because of time, but I agree 100 percent with what you're saying, Tamiko. We're doing the same thing. Like the AR is an entry point for our primary source documents, which is a retelling of history, and we'll use all of that foundation to build as technology evolves over time. So yes. Great, just one last question. We unfortunately are out of time, but we'll take one more. Um, someone's asking about a transformative experience, um, thinking about world building. Do you want the experiences to be transformative? And I guess when we're talking about place, it's like, how does the place transform or how does your perception of that place transform? Um, and is that a, a goal? Uh, for your, for your work. Um, does someone want to speak to that transformative process or help you reimagine the place? Glenn, you have your mic off. Oh, um, sure. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay, I mean like, um, yeah, what, like part of our, our vision statement is to change behavior. So we think about it um, along similar lines to like how uh, the environmental movement, like that, that was a generation long process that started changing behaviors at the micro and macro levels. Similarly, when it comes to conversations uh, revolving around racial equity, we want the stories to serve as the foundation for, okay, here are like living, breathing examples of like people who have pursued it in different ways. And then like, it should also serve as a, uh, a humanizing factor because people are aware of the history. So then with that humanization at the micro level and then that context uh, for equity at the macro level, we do want to our, our app to serve as a conduit for a generational process of behavioral change and for racial equity in ways that we don't understand right now as a collective consciousness. So yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to um, add to that the sort of the process of world building, um, um, especially for people who may not have used AR, what might not be so clear is that, of course, you're situated in a specific place when you look at it and, and you know, that could be your bedroom, but it um, could also um, uh, be in the ideal context, really a specific site where uh, you are addressing the history of the site. You're also addressing the, uh, the physical the space of the site, you're interacting with that site, um, you, you know, you're, you're walking around. Uh, this is for me the difference also between having an AR piece that's uh, a single object versus the sort of installations that I like to do where, you know, if it's a single object, then you need to look in one direction and then you see it and that's, and that's kind of it. With an installation, you need to explore the space around you. And then it's, uh, it's you know, lots of people who haven't used AR before, they think of it as, oh, there's an image on in the display of my smartphone. And for, especially for installations, I always say, no, your smartphone is a window into a parallel dimension that is positioned at this site and could be an entire world. So you need to, it's, it's like, a, a, I call it an AR scope. It's like a telescope into another dimension. You need to explore your surroundings. And that process of exploring your surroundings, you're embedding your body, your proprioceptive senses, and the visual and aural content that you're experiencing there in a specific experience with that site. And that's, that's just worlds apart from looking at an image on a screen in your bedroom. And that's the total experience what one writer rewrote right uh, talks about trying on Deleuze and Guattari and I try and avoid quoting French philosophers but in, in her case she made a good point that uh, the artwork is not the thing you see on the screen the artwork is the content you see on the screen uh, how you're interacting uh, with it uh, through your smartphone your entire body motions it's the site itself what you know about the site what maybe other people are telling you about the site it's an assemblage of the environment uh, and your entire body um, what you're viewing as the ar all the different levels that you're bringing to it. And that's the artwork. You're part of it, the environment's part of it, and what's in the app is part of it. None of these pieces can be uh, interchanged without changing the artwork itself. Fantastic. Um, on that note, we're gonna end. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. Your work is incredibly inspiring and hopefully will inspire other people on this uh, uh, talk. Um, and thank you to all the panelists, the audience for being here today. Uh, we'll be back next week at the same time, Tuesday at 12, with another panel about bringing communities together by augmenting places with stories, voices, and technologies. So we hope to see you next week. And thank you. And thank you all. Goodbye.